Okay, now tell me again about that mess thing, whatever. Well, they wouldn't let us into the mess hall, and we were just scrounging and stealing all the food we could. We needed. And then, uh, for some reason or other, they were issuing mess passes for the California. So we figured, hell, discretion's a better part of valor, so rather than starve, we transferred immediately to the California. But there was, uh, they had California officers checking the line as you were going in. Well, after a few hassles, they put on the back of it Oklahoma. Now, how did you, when I mean, you say you transferred to the California, how did you? Well, we, we weren't transferred to the California. We just went over and got it. <laughs> <laughs> and where'd you get it from? What? I haven't the slightest idea. You can see what, yeah. Somebody was just given out these passes, mm -hmm. and uh, that was two or three weeks after the the uh, raid. Mm -hmm. Now, have you seen any of these things here? No. Uh -uh. I, now, here again, don't ask me where we got these, but evidently I did. But see, it's a printed form here, mm -hmm. and. Uh, we were complaining when they gave them to us. I know we were bitching like hell. Hey, we don't even have the two cents to send this thing because we didn't. And so they said, oh, all you have to do is put uh, sailor's mail on it up in the stamp. Well, as you see, that one went to my aunt, but this one here, the government got their two cents anyways. Hmm. Now, here's another thing that I don't know where I got it, but it must have been in some office or something because it's, it's typewritten. And uh, we had no identification pass. We were on Ford Island there. So, and we were wandering all over the, uh, we would go all over the, the sub, I mean, the, the Navy Yard there. Like I said, I went over to the Indianapolis. But sometime or other, they evidently issued that to us. Now, you see, it's just a three by five card. Navy identification pass. Yeah. Oklahoma Survivor. Yeah, that's what that says. Paul Albert Goodyear. Yeah. Hmm. J.C. Spencer. He was an officer, I am. Oh, that's just on a three by five card. That's oh. all it is. Yeah. That's all it is. So that's, uh, I don't know if any of these things would help you. I'd be Definitely, glad sure. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to keep one of yeah, those whichever, cards. Yeah, whichever one you want. It doesn't want. make any difference to me. It's One is, well, I married that gal and she died in Guatemala a few years ago, but this was to my aunt. But uh, see, that one's one's dated February, uh, December 9th, and one's dated December. 11th. And I don't know where we got those things. Mm -hmm. They're both pretty much the same, I think. Yeah. Whichever one. Well, it doesn't make any difference to okay. me. That one, uh, being as how it's written in ink, may last a little yeah, bit longer. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. This will probably last outlast me anyway. So, that's about it. Is this you? Yeah, that was me later on in the war. You can see how thin I was and had hickeys all over my face. And see, I weighed 185 when I went in service, and as you can see from this here, I was 175 after Pearl. And when I came home, I weighed 135. Well, I... Is, huh? is this an extra photograph? No, that's the only one that's I got. Yeah. Okay. I spent 41 months over there. And I, I weighed 135 when I came home. Let's see, you wanted this? Yeah, if, if we... Yeah, you can have that. Yeah. And you wanted that? Yes, sir. And you wanted that. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know if you ever saw this, but after the... 
Well, this was after I got back out to the South Pacific. Uh, I had already been assigned to this flag, Staff Combat Div 8. And they came around and said, hey, anybody want to buy pictures of Pearl Harbor? And of course I did. I think we paid a couple of bucks for them. But those were official Navy photographs. The Navy sold them. At least that's what we were told. Yeah. There's one in there of the Yoki. There's Yoki in a couple of them, one in long shot. Okay, there's the Oklahoma there. Yeah, that's the Oklahoma. Now the one from the dry dock is also... No, that's the Nevada. Okay, now here's the Oklahoma again. Yeah. That was me at, let's see. Well, that must that was be that was after Pearl Harbor because uh, I was first class and I was only third class in yeah. Pearl. But there's a long shot in here of the Oki too. Nope, it's the uh, it's the one from the dry dock. There's another one with a dry dock in it, where you can see the... Well, is that it? That's the no, Oklahoma there. No. Yeah, that's the that. Oklahoma. Where's the other one of the Oklahoma? That's the Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. This is probably taken... The Oklahoma is just, a, just in front of this. I thought there was one here. This is the Ogallala here. I don't see it there. <laughs> well, that's one thing I don't understand. This photograph just shows the tip of the Oklahoma up. But this shows almost the whole hole. Well, those are from different angles. Uh, See, it went over quite a ways there. See, here's the keel right here. Yeah. And this is the top of this. You're you're looking at the side of the ship okay, here. Okay. Okay. See, this and is this the is side. And this is an in view. Okay. And this, is, see, here's the side right here. See, if you were to stand out here and look at that. Yeah. Oh, that's you see what that. you see. Okay. See? I see. I see. See, this is the, the side we all, not all, but the side I slid down in a lot of them, and then we slid down here and jumped off the keel. Mm -hmm. Now that guy Taylor that I met tonight, he and I were both stand evidently at damn near the same time. We were because we both talked to the exec down there, Commander Kenworthy. Mm -hmm. So uh, we and we were all three st standing on the uh, uh, keel. But I didn't introduce myself that night. <laughs> that <time. laughs> <laughs> I waited a few years. Now those are official Navy photographs, mm -hmm. and you could probably get better shots of them if, in your capacity. Uh, we're getting photographs in the National Archives. I would imagine yeah. so, because these are copies, and uh, I mean they they were probably uh, not the best photographs, especially since they when put them up. Taken? This photograph for you. Mm. Oh, it was probably taken around 1943 or 44. Mm -hmm. What ship did you go on after the Oklahoma? Well, I didn't even leave Pearl until the May. Of uh, 42? 42, yeah. We didn't get paid until April, and then they finally found us. And uh, I was assigned to the Indiana. We went back and put that in commission, then we went through the canal, and very shortly I was assigned to Combat Div 8, and I stayed in Combat Div 8 for yeah. until November 44. Where were you when the attack started in the Oklahoma? I had the signal watch that morning. I was supervisor of the signal watch. I had three men. Were you on the bridge? Yeah, I was on on the signal bridge. Where's that? That's right below the con bridge. 
Well, let's see if you can see it. On. There's none of these ships in good enough condition to. But I think maybe. Is that on the superstructure or is it? Oh, yeah, it's right. Well, now here's. This is the Maryland, and she was very similar to ours. You'd probably break that thing. See, it only took me 11 months to sink the Oklahoma. <laughs> what do you remember about the attack? What's the first thing you remember? Well, we were watching the bastards flying around before they even dropped a bomb. I'm, I've am i been very disappointed in myself because I couldn't have done anything, but I think I could have saved a few lives. I think the guys on the signal bridge were the... A few of the people that could have saved lives without heroics. I mean, there was a lot of heroics. I mean, but we had a speaker system that originated on a bridge because of during the underway, the uh, uh, bosun's mates stayed on the signal bridge and passed the, all the communication throughout the ship from the signal bridge. And we had that thing there, and all we had to do was just press a button and say, hey, look, we're in a fix here. Let's do something, or at least get the hell out. Yeah. And it, like one guy told me today, he says, or this reunion, he says, yeah, if we'd have had five minutes, it would have helped a lot. And I think we could have given them that five minutes, but <laughs> I was new in the damn Navy and scared to death and running around not knowing what to do, and uh, I'm sure if, if I'd have had more experience, I wouldn't have hesitated. But you don't ju you don't just call a ship to general quarters when you're a third class petty officer <laughs> and brand new in the navy. <laughs> so I've kind of kicked myself, but you can't live with that. You can't fault yourself. So, and I think the Signal Gang was one of the only outfits on the ship that put up any uh, military uh, resistance. I've never heard of a shot being fired from the Oklahoma, although somebody has told me that they thought a three-inch shell was fired. But I know that we put up the Roger flag. <laughs> that's as far as, that's as antagonistic as we got to the chance. what's the Roger flag? The Roger flag is a command to start shooting, open fire. Whenever there's a battle or target practice or anything else, uh, uh, if, if at that time, if all communication practically was, was by flag or light or something like that, there was no radio or TBS. Or and what does the Roger flag look like? Well, it's a red flag with a yellow cross in it. And I know that the Oklahoma went down with the Roger flag flying. So I've always said I think that was the only militaristic thing the Oklahoma did that day, much to my regret. I know I, when we saw these Japs flying around, I, myself and two of the strikers, Driver and Luttrell, we ran over to the port side tried to get the anti-aircraft gunners down there to open fire, and they just kind of shook us off and says, hey, Flags, you're drunk. You had too much to drink last night. And we says, hey, look over there. There's torpedoes coming at us. And there were, there were two torpedoes in the water at, right at us at that time. But I've been told by those guys that they didn't have any power, they didn't have any ammunition, so it wouldn't have done any good even if they'd have believed us. So, I don't know. It was a mess, that's all I can say. Someone said that some Marines up there fired a 50 caliber. At the that's, I've heard that too, but I don't know. So that's why I said that as far as I know, yeah. uh, I hope the hell they did and I hope the hell they, they hit something. But uh, 
I didn't see. You know, later on you could tell, I mean, well, anytime you can tell, even on a battleship, if, if a gun is fired. But we were taking, I counted five fish. Somebody said there was four, and I've heard seven. I don't know, but I know five. And we took a bomb because that's where my striker was killed on the forecastle. He had volunteered to go up and raise the Union Jack that morning. That was our part of our job was to raise the Union Jack, and he was up there, and I never saw him again. I hope he got off, but I was told later that he was killed when that bomb went off on the on the forecastle. So I don't know. Now, where was that on the ship? Well, the the four part of the ship. See, the 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 uh, Union Jack is flown in port right at the bow, the very bow of the ship. Uh, there must be a picture in here of the, the bow of the ship. You know, right smack dab in the. Where is that? Now yeah. there's a flag. They're flying. Yeah, well, that's the U.S. flag, yeah. and, and that's flying at the stern, but uh, the, uh, well, here it is right here. See, here's the Nevada, and she's underway there. See, right at the bow of the ship? Yeah. See that yard arm there? That's where, that mast, that's where he would put it up. We kept it folded up in a certain way, and you'd run, run it up and then when uh, colors were sounded you just break it and it would flare out black but I never saw young again so I don't know now the Nevada and the Oklahoma were sister ships yeah were they identical <laughs> I was too raw a recruit <laughs> <laughs> to tell you that see I was a, I was just in the reserve I wasn't the regular Navy I went aboard as a third class and early, I don't know, it was after January, but February or March, I don't remember. And uh, I was still learning my way around the Navy, let alone the ship, you know, I didn't know a damn thing. But, uh, what was your rank when you went on board? I went aboard as signalman third class, and I left as signalman third class. So, no, that's why I say if I'd have had a little more experience and a little more savvy, it might have, wouldn't have changed anything, but maybe a few more guys would have gotten out. But I'd, I'd like to think that's true. I don't know. What if they could just close the hatches on the blister ledge? That would have helped. Well, for one thing, there was an awful lot of guys trapped below deck. And if you live below decks, as we did, see our quarters were on the third deck below the uh, uh, armored deck. And boy, whenever anything happened, you just hit that ladder and you got up above that, that deck because you knew damn well they were going to close that up no matter what, you know. Of course, we could have gotten a few guys out, radioman and signalman, because when that thing, those fish came right in through the radio compartment. At least some of them I know did. And there wasn't a damn thing except stanchions between the radioman and signalman, see, so they, they were just trapped down there like mm -hmm. rats. And they didn't have a chance. And if they'd have gotten a word, they would have, some of them anyways, would have run like hell. We had to run through two compartments to get up above that deck. But I'll tell you, we really did it because when we when we rammed into the Pennsylvania a few weeks before, I was down there playing AC Ducey or something in my skivvies, and we got topside before the sparks quit flying. <laughs> I mean, we could. You you knew that by heart. So you didn't go below deck on the Oklahoma then when the attack started. No way, no way did I go below that. I, uh, when it got too bad, I left the signal bridge and I got down to the boat deck. And this is again how my stupidity and my ignorance 
played. But I got down on the boat deck and I thought, holy God, I'm the supervisor of the watch and I'm responsible for that code book. Now this code book was about as secret as the daily paper, but it had just the ordinary flag code in it, you know. And very simple. So probably one of the most ignorant things I ever did in my life. I got up back up on the signal bridge and grabbed that thing and it's a, about as big as a phone book here except that it's got lead covers on it. And I carried that cotton picking thing down and over the side and finally standing on the... I offered it to the exec and he looked at me like I was the most stupid person in the world for doing that, which I was. And he says, get rid of it. So I just threw it over the side, oh, dropped it in the water because we were both standing on the keel. But when I came down the second time, the ship was listing pretty badly. And I was trying to hang on to this thing, you know, this book, this very precious book that I didn't want to fall into enemy hands. <laughs> because that was actually my thought at that time. <laughs> but I uh, called the, uh, uh, I was hanging on and the ship was listing and I was trying to get down this ladder. So actually I was just kind of laying there trying to get my breath hanging on to a line and holding this book. And I looked back over Aia and I could see this flight of uh, dive bombers coming in. I could tell pretty accurately what they were thinking about. I think there was two or three of them. And they were lined up perfectly on Battleship Row. And I just lay there for a few minutes. I kept my eye on them and I watched them. And if epithets deleted would knock down an airplane. I'd knock down all three of them, but they peeled off. And the first one, I saw him drop his bomb, and I just praying it wouldn't hit us. And I saw it go for the Arizona, and I saw it go just behind number one turret on the port side, and I thought, well, it missed us. So I started moving. And I didn't see the Arizona blow up until a few minutes later. I was trying to call, crawl over the lifeline here on the starboard side to get out on the side of the ship. And I looked back and I could see that there was a lot more smoke than when I started, so I knew something had happened. But I don't remember seeing the explosion, but I did see that damn bomb come down. And I did see it go in right alongside number one turret, or just behind number one turret from my angle. Now people have told me that that bomb went down the stack, and I know damn well it didn't go down the stack. I asked a guy at Ship's History in Washington if the bomb went down the smokestack, and he said, no, but we wish it had. Yeah. It went down the smokestack, it went in the engine room, and just blown up in the engine room. That's right. And it, it wouldn't have blown up the ship. That's right. But, uh, but it went down. I know, I know, and I'm not, I can remember that damn thing. I can remember just how it came off of that damn ship. It's funny how you can remember those things years later. But I still see that son of a bitch and bomb leave that plane he was coming in even and all of a sudden he went into his dive and he dropped his bomb and I followed it and as soon as I saw it go behind the turret I thought well I felt relieved of course there was 1100 other guys that weren't relieved but I was and I didn't realize what I had, what I had done, thought about or prayed about that time but uh, that's the, uh, and 
I swam to the uh, Maryland, and all oh, the oil was thicker than it must have been. Six, I don't know, it was six eight inches thick of oil, like that. And I got a hold of the blister of the Maryland, and I deposited some of my stomach on the blister. And uh, then somebody threw out a monkey fist down to me and started, I wrapped it around my... With a monkey fist? It's a heaving line with a lead uh, weight on the end so that they can throw it between ships or things like that. You've seen them in movies where the guys throw a line. They throw a small line and bring over larger lines. Well, this is a small line. And he threw that down to me, and I grabbed it and wrapped the monkey fist around my right arm. And I started to pull myself up out of the water. He was pulling on me, and I started to pull myself up on the torpedo blister with my left arm. And I'm looking up at him, or up here. And all of a sudden, I see white spots appear on the side of the ship between my hand and my head. And I just kind of stopped and went, what the hell are those? Why, hell, those are bullets. Well, I realized that was too close, so I thought that oil looked pretty damn good, so I went down for another, back in for another taste of the oil. <laughs> and eventually we worked it out, and I got on, on to the uh, Maryland, and they had lost, uh, well, I laid there for a while, and I returned the oil to the Navy. And uh, they had lost power on their ammunition hoist for the Bofors 1.1s. So uh, there were other survivors on there, and we formed a Bucket Brigade passing these clips of four one point oh uh, one inch bofers across the deck. We didn't have to pass too many because the damn things were always jammed up. But we uh, we passed them along as much as we could, and uh, then they passed the word. To the captain didn't want any strangers on the ship, so we had to go over and we got onto the berths. Had these big islands, and, oh, they were 15, 20 feet square that the ship's tied up to. They're still there, I think. You've probably seen them. We got on those and then we. I don't know how the hell we got down there, I don't remember. But from there, we just waded ashore onto Ford Island. Did they all catch on fire? Yeah. Yeah, it did. Where were you when that happened? I was between the two ships. But even that looked pretty damn good. But of course, you know, now I realize those bullets were long gone, because when I saw them, they were already past my head. When they hit that de that the side of that ship, they were. But you just don't think of that. Uh, maybe now, after the combat experience we had, I, I'd know. But hell, we didn't have any combat experience. Nobody told us the, anything. We weren't prepared for this. I mean, we weren't as prepared as the Navy was unprepared. And I've told you how the damn Navy, boy, they screwed us up like chicken with a wet noodle. But uh, we were standing around over there on the beach. Some officer come up, and I, I know who it was. He was Ensign Bacchus. And I understand he became a rear admiral. And he said, why don't you boys go and uh, take some of the dependents down to uh, BOQ? We had nothing else to do. So the, we just happened to find a pickup truck. And 
and I, we thought that that was a pretty damn good thing to pick up dependents with. So we went around and picked up some women and children, took them down to BOQ, and that that pickup truck was kind of nice. In fact, we kept it for about three months. We had a hell of a time keeping people from stealing it, but uh, there was a lot of thieves there. So we'd have to tear the thing apart every night to keep it from being stolen the next morning. <laughs> but uh, And then that evening, we were just wandering around. By this time, we'd already appropriated a couple of rifles. And we were down around a BOQ, and this truck came up. And uh, they said, hey, we need volunteers here to help. So a couple of us went over and got Hold out your hand, we hold out our hand. They put light things wrapped in brown paper in our arms. So I took it into the BOQ. There was a gray haired lady there. I says, What are these? She says, They're blankets. So I went back and I volunteered to get right in the head of the line. But despite the fact that there was a double swinging door with lights on it, and it was probably the only lights between Japan and San Francisco at that time, I never could find that door. So I just put the, the blankets in the back of our truck. I figured they'd get good use. Because we had nothing. We didn't have clothes. We didn't have nothing nothing. Uh, we had broken into a laundry and thrown our oily clothes away, but uh, we uh, put on clean clothes, but over that oil and dirt, <laughs> we were still a mess. So, but we did have blankets for them. And in fact, I had one for 20 years. I've been moving around. I've since lost it. But I, I had that blanket for about 20 years because I think it's the only blanket I ever had in the Navy after that. Uh, then uh, we got thinking of uh, how are we going to let our parents know? We had no money. Like We didn't even have two cents to buy a stamp to put on a piece of paper they gave us. So this one guy says, hey, he said, I had $20 in my pocket when I went over the side. So the Marines aren't going to like this, but they were guarding the uh, laundry by that time. And I think it was a, they knew what we were doing, but some of the guys would talk to the Marines, and the rest, a couple of us snuck in back into the laundry. And where in the hell were you when you changed clothes? Well, I was about over here or something. Well, I have to admit that we weren't the only ones that had raided that laundry. Uh, there must have been a pile of oil held up by rags at least three foot deep, or bigger than this room. And where in the hell were you? Well, I was over there, so we st and in about a half an hour, we found his pants and the twenty dollars. <laughs> so he went out and he bought a piece of paper, a stamp, and an envelope, and he wrote to his mother, and he says, "Please notify the parents of the following that their sons are alive." And we all signed our names on this one sheet of paper. He had to write on one side of the sheet, and very small writing so we could get a lot of names on there. Boy, we got, I don't know how many. But my parents were dead, so I put my grandmother's name on it. And I know this guy was from Massachusetts, and I wish the hell I knew who he was, because God bless that woman. She, she I don't know whether she wrote to all of them, but my grandmother got the word on December 31st that I was alive. And in the meantime, I, I don't know how in the hell they did it, but they had recorded me missing. And uh, so that helped a little bit, I guess. Mm -hmm. so. 
then we we just wandered around there and then somebody says hey they need a they need to establish a signal post or something like that in case there's another attack and all uh, radio and stuff like that so they wanted uh, to set up a signal station there on the island and uh, somebody said well go up on top of the uh, and most of the guys I was with were signal so they we went up on top of the uh, firehouse and that's where we lived and slept and ate and worked we set up this we had no flag we got a, a lamp of some kind and we got some semaphores that's all we had but uh, at least the main signal tower on, on uh, the Navy Yard knew where we were and if they wanted to communicate with anybody in an emergency, I guess they could have. We never did. Because we never lost power. Either. But we lived up there. We slept on that uh, rock uh, floor. Well, it was a roof, but it was our floor. No, We had no protection over us. We were just out there in the open thing. It was colder than hell. Of course, we didn't have any clothes. But we'd bundle up in these blankets we'd store. And we, we survived. We didn't eat, but we survived. But thank God for that truck because, boy, we that truck helped us steal more stuff than. How'd you steal the stuff without getting caught? Oh, we just lie. We just lie. We go. We went down that afternoon. We went down to the naval. Uh, the air station there, you know, where the P PBYs were first hit. The, there's a picture of them piled up here. These these things here. We went down there. And yeah, the, the airplanes. Yeah. yeah, we were down there, and we ran into a guy. He was opening some doors, and we said, "Hey, we need some rifles." He said, "I haven't got any rifles. I got 30 caliber machine guns." Oh, that's all right. And so we took it. We just, he didn't ask us anything. We took it. I mean, he gave it to us. We did, boy, that's not stealing when a guy gives it to you. you know. But here's a bunch of signalmen that didn't know beans from nothing. We didn't even know what to do with this. And that's what I say, this Glidewell, and that's why that name rang up bell with me, and I knew, because he was a good buddy of mine, he was first class seaman at the time, he had been a horse soldier, well he was with us, so he taught us how to assemble the thing in the first place, and they gave us a whole one or two boxes of ammunition, but it was just loose shells in there with clips. Well, Glidewell knew how to put those a that ammunition together, how to clean up the gun and assemble it. And then he says, well, you got to learn to shoot it. So he'd make us sit there on top of the thing, field strip it, tear it down, field strip it, jam it up. What do you do when it gets jammed up? He was a good teacher. so It's probably a good thing the Japs didn't come back because we probably would have shot up the Navy Yard and everything else. <laughs> we didn't know what the hell we were doing. good and it made us feel good to have that thing up there <laughs> and every day we'd clean the damn thing up and I guess we'd say prayers to it or something but we it made us feel good to have it we had we had stolen a few rifles I don't know where the rifles came from but we had I think there was six of us and we had three or four rifles now how'd you get food during those first days well we just scrounged it uh, see, that's why I say that truck was very handy. They were uh, trying to lighten the uh, California, see, because it just settled straight down. And they were taking ammunition and everything movable off. They send the hard hats down there and they bring it up in nets, just stick it on the dock there. 
Well, we'd drive up there in this truck, which was better than any car that Al Capone ever had. And we'd drive up there, and the, the Marines were guarding it. We'd say, hey, we got a work party to pick up some supplies. Okay. Go ahead. And we'd just start throwing these gallon cans into the back of the truck. Of course, the labels had all been washed off. We'd throw them in there. And then the Marine would say, Oh, you have to sign for that, sir. I think, although I'm not sure, but I was probably the senior man there being a third class petty officer. But whoever he talked to, it didn't make any difference whether it was a, an apprentice seaman or me. We just signed the name Lieutenant Joe Blow or <laughs> Ensign Peter Graves or something like that probably more forgeries at Pearl Harbor than, than the team men have ever caught if, if they only knew. But uh, then we'd go back and whenever we never knew what we were going to eat. When we got hungry we'd open a can and whatever we opened we'd eat. Like I say, we we might have breakfast of asparagus and pears or you, you'd have uh, beans and spinach or something like that. Just whatever the cans happened. There was no way to identify them because there was no labels on them. And then we found out that the, at the back of the mess hall they'd uh, give a half a loaf of bread and an apple. Where they got the apples I don't know. But uh, they give you an apple and a half a loaf of bread for each man on a working party. So what we would do is we'd change off, and that was only at noon, about 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. So two of us would go over one day and we'd say, hey, we got a working party of uh, eight men over here digging trenches. And so they'd give us four loaves of bread and eight apples. Well, the next day, two other guys would drive up there in the same truck and we say, hey, we got a working party of 14 men over on this side. <laughs> they couldn't keep track of it. And they, we never came too often, you know, the same guys. We Maybe I'd drive one day and the other guy would get out and he'd get the rations. And the next day, I'd get out and get the rations while he drove. But then the next couple of days, two other guys would take over. But we'd just keep going around and around like that. So we got apples, and we got uh, the canned goods, and we got the, the bread. So we, we made out pretty good. And tell me about going on board the Indianapolis again. Oh, yeah. I don't know. As in the historians, you could find out when the Indianapolis came in, but I saw it come in. And I had a good buddy on that, Tuck O'Neill. And so I went over to the Navy Yard. They tied up in the Navy Yard, and I went over to the Navy Yard. And being a signalman, I stood on the dock, and I short-armed him. I said, hey, how about coming aboard and uh, getting uh, a bath? Because this was a week or ten days, I'm pretty sure. I was pretty right by that time. And I had crotchets and sores all over. And so he said, yeah, come aboard. So I walk up and I've, to this day I can still see that poor little ensign. He'd probably just come in, he saw all those bodies in the water and the ships burning and stuff. And then to see this decrepit, dirty, filthy, unshaven sailor, which is absolutely anathema in the Navy. I was absolutely everything that shouldn't be in the Navy. It was filthy, dirty, unkept, unshaven, no hat, no nothing. Our clothes were dirty because the oil and stuff just came off of our body and got on the clothes. Oh, we had crotchets. Every place your skin touched you, we had sores. And I have permission to come aboard, sir, and he just kind of stared at me. He looked at me, and I don't think he 
really believe me. But he turns to Tuck, who he knew, and he says, Tuck, do you know this man? He says, yes, sir, Captain. He says, I went to school with him. So he told me to come aboard, and he says to Tuck, take him down to the uh, master at Am arm shack and get him some clothes and get him a shower. Well, I thought I was in seventh heaven right then, but we turned to walk across the quarter deck, and he yelled after us, and he said, Oh, Tuck, take him down to the mess hall and get him a, a meal. Well, right then I thought that captain was God. So we got me some clothes, and I had a nice shower, and we went down to the mess hall. And I don't know the, the, the cooks, whether they knew we were coming or not, but I got steak and eggs. <laughs> and that was the first meal, I'd, meal that I'd had since breakfast on December 7th. Now, I don't know just exactly how long that was, but it was a week or so. I'm pretty sure, because I don't think I could have gotten so stinky in less time. But that was the first meal we got, or I got. Uh, and then we finally got into the mess hall in Port Island there. I know we were in there by Christmas. It was just a little bit before Christmas that we got in there. Now, when did you use this passage you have from the California? Or what, how, when did you use this? That was for us to get into the mess hall there at Ford Island. So that's when you got this? Yeah. Okay. That's when they gave us that. And I don't know why it was issued to the California, but you can see it was issued to the California. And I don't know why. But they... Uh, we, we just found out they were issuing passes to the California, and by God, we... Well, hell, we've been living by our wits anyway, so we might just well try this. The only thing they could do is refuse us, so we got it. We how'd, got it. How'd you get it? What do you mean, how did I... I mean, did you just go get in line and pick this up, or...? I suppose so, yeah. They were probably... You know how scuttlebutt goes around the Navy, and somebody's... We had guys out scrounging anything they could get, clothes or food or anything. Some probably came back and said, hey, they're going to give out chits for, for the California. So we went around and probably stood on the sidelines for a few minutes and see how the modus operandi was and what they were doing. And so we just got in line, and we all got one of those. I mean, the, the five or six guys I was with, I'm sure... Glidewell, whether he still got it, but he, I'm sure he got one. Glidewell wasn't on watch with me that morning. He was in my sea watch, but he was our port watches, of course, were much smaller. Yeah, he went down below deck. Huh? He went down below deck. Yeah, that's what I, I read that thing that you got from But he said he got the battle bag. And yeah, yeah. Well, his uh, his battle station was down below. Mine was on the signal bridge, so even if they'd called general quarters, I'd have stayed on the signal bridge. I always stayed on the signal bridge. So. In fact, I didn't... I never heard of that. I knew he got off because I know he was with us when we were on the fire tower. And then that Stapleton... I remember him, and those are the first signalmen that I've ever heard of since then, since I came out of Pearl. But I'm sure we lost a lot of our crew down there when those fish came in, because it came right in our compartment down there. Yeah, he said that, well, in that portion yeah. of red, it came right the deck blowing and buckled the deck. Well, yeah. Well, that was where he was. He didn't go down into our compartment. Yeah. Oh, he was in battle aft, and that was way in the stern of the ship. Uh, and we were in the fore part of the ship, but we were down below the armored deck. See, there was a 
radio shack was right up against the, the bulkhead there where those torpedoes came in. And I have never heard of a radioman survivor because unless they were topside, they didn't have a prayer because that came right into either into the radio shack or just below it. And then if they were off duty, they were probably getting ready to go ashore or getting ready to go to church or something like that, or they'd just come off of, off of uh, duty and they were changing their clothes or something like that. So they were probably in their compartment, the same as many of our guys were. Although our battles, our workstation happened, mine happened to be above deck. If I'd have been a radio man and on watch that day, I would have greeted the torpedoes as they came through the and that's why the communication gang was uh, pretty well crippled up. And I, uh, just tonight after the banquet, somebody says that he's been to a Pearl Harbor survivors meeting in Memphis. And he ran into a guy by the name of C.A. Dunn. In fact, he just gave him his... his uh, No, he didn't either. His address, someplace I got it. Memphis, Tennessee. And I remember a Dunn, and he was a striker. But I don't, uh, I never heard, I never saw him. <laughs> Ryburn, I'll tell you this story, he was on watch with me that morning. He was from Arkansas scared to death of water. When we used to make liberties, we'd go out to the park there and listen to uh, Hawaii calls. Well, we'd go swimming. There was no... You just laid on the grass or did whatever, and you'd listen to it in the background. And we'd go out there and go swimming in the pool, or sometimes we'd lay on the grass. But if we go swimming, Ryburn would put his bathing suit on, but he wouldn't go near that water. It was Close I ever saw him was put his toes in the water and sit on the step on the side. And I don't know, a couple of weeks after I ran into him. And I hadn't seen him since we left the bridge that morning. And I knew he was dead because he wouldn't even get near the water. But I ran into him and I said, My God, how you can't be alive. How the hell did you get off? He says, I swam. I says, where in the hell did you swim to? He says, well, I swam to the sub base. <laughs> That's got to be damn near a mile. <laughs> so you see, you can do damn near anything when you have to. <laughs> you know, here's something that I think. Now, this is, again, hearsay because I was not over there. But you know Captain Foy had just been relieved and he was a damn good skipper. And uh, he uh, naturally wasn't on the ship, but uh, I didn't see this because I was on Ford Island. There's no way he could get there. But in talking with guys that were around the Navy base, around the sub base, over on the mainland of the island, of course, I've heard that Captain and Mrs. Foy, I don't know what, how they got it, but they loaded up, they had a big Buick, and they loaded up the back end of that thing with soap, toothbrushes, toothpaste, and everything else. And they, they just drove around the whole installation over there like, peddlers of old hawking stuff, but instead of peddling ice or uh, fresh fish or something like that, they would say, they would call out any survivors of the Oklahoma, and when they found them, they'd give them toothpaste, soap, and whatever stuff they had, and I, I thought that was, although I didn't get any of it, I thought that was a real remarkable thing for him to do. I heard a story about one guy walked one of those lines from the Oklahoma to Maryland. That's hard to believe because I don't think any of 
because for one thing, huh, as soon as that damn ship started to roll, there must have been so much tension on those. Those lines were big, and they could have been. But if he got on it at the right time, he could have. But boy, uh, that thing must have snapped early. Uh, I just did an interview today, and they said they're like, you know, three or four lines. There. Oh, there are. And they said when the Oklahoma rolled, they said those lines were just tight. Oh, they would and be. And then they said the Maryland people said, cut the line. Yeah. And they had a guy with an axe, and he, uh, one, two, three, and they cut all the lines, and they just snapped. Oh, they sure, they would. Oh, the, the tension on those things. Because you've got a 29,000 ton ship there just champing at the bit to. And he said that. When it was rolling and those lines went tight, it slowed down, and yeah. then when they cut the lines, it went on over. Uh -huh. Well, I, I probably felt it, but I didn't sense it. Yeah. But uh, I had never heard that. Did the mast break off when they hit the water or just go on down? Or do you know? Do you... No, I don't know. But I heard uh, somebody told me afterwards from another ship that they logged the mast of the Indian, of the, <laughs> Indiana, that was a ship I was on later on, of the uh, Oklahoma under in 10 minutes. Now, I don't know that either because uh, it was under when, it had to be under when I went off of the, but I was not worried about the mast or anything else. I was just looking out for number one and I'd given up all hope of saving the ship or winning the war or, but uh, when I took that uh, code book down I thought my god what a heroic intelligent thing to do and I expected Kenworthy to put the Congressional Medal of Honor around my neck and say hey boy well done but it was probably the most stupid thing I ever did in my life <laughs> But it's just how how silly things were that day. They were the Navy wasn't the only thing fouled polished up. Some of the sailors were pretty well fouled up too, because mm -hmm. I was. What's your fondest memory of the Oklahoma? Hmm. Well, I don't have the length of time that some of these old timers had on there, but I thought it was a damn good ship, and we had a, a damn good crew, and I served with a lot of officers, and I thought a, a group of officers and a group of men, they were about as A1 as a crew could get. There just weren't any real problems amongst any of them, crew or officers. And I, you have to remember, I went aboard there as a Naval Reserve before the Naval Reserve was too well accepted in the Navy. And I heard that some of the Naval Reserves weren't accepted too good. But I didn't have one damn bit of trouble. And I think that speaks a lot for the crew and the men when they'll accept outsiders like that to just come in and take them into their heart. I never had one iota of uh, prejudice or animosity or anything. So I liked the Oklahoma. I was real sorry. And, and I'll tell you, when I found out just last year, I've lived overseas for 15 years, so I was out of most everything. But uh, when I found out last year that the Oklahoma had a group, I got in touch with somebody, and I found out. So this is my first uh, reunion. I'll probably go tomorrow. Mm -hmm. but, uh, I enjoyed the Oklahoma. I thought it was a damn good ship. Well, I think that's probably... Uh, you probably picked what brains I've got. <laughs> <laughs> oh, when did you join the Navy? Oh, let's see. I joined the Navy. Well, I didn't join the Navy, you know. 
I joined, the, I was in the Naval Reserve. Oh, okay. And uh, we were sent, let's see, about, I would say in September of 40, we went to signal school at Navy Pier in Chicago and the Willamette was tied up alongside. That was that uh, cruise ship that had turned over in Chicago years before and drowned a lot of people. We lived on the Willamette, which was tied up alongside Navy Pier and, and took our classes. And, but then it got too cold in the, and so they just issued us bunks and we just bunked around in the in the Navy Pier. And then in late January, we got on a train and headed for San Diego. All of these signalmen from this B6 class, B6 and B7, we went to the destroyer base in San Diego. And we stayed there for some time. Captain McCandless was the captain of that. His son later won the Congressional Medal of Honor on the Chicago at the Battle of Iron Bottom Sound. And his grandson was a, an astronaut here in the last couple of years, you know. He was a good skipper, too. He worked you like hell, but he fed you good. And then I don't know how the hell I got assigned to the Oklahoma. But I must have been. And as transportation became available, they were shipping us out. And I know I got on the, the row, R-O-E, it was uh, DD-316. And we were going to Pearl, but right after we left San Diego, we headed up and went into Pedro and stayed there a couple of days before we went on into uh, Pearl. And that's why I think I probably got on the Oklahoma late in, sometime in February or early March, because I know we stayed, it was late in January when we left Chicago. We stayed in San Diego for a while and then the trip over. So I just figured it was late February or early March when I reported the board. Could have been a little later. I don't because I don't remember just exactly how long we were at the Des base there. But I remember we went over on the road. Or I did and some other fellows. I don't know how many passengers they had on. Do you remember when you went aboard the Oklahoma the date? Did what? Do you remember the date you went aboard the Oklahoma? That's what I say. No, I don't remember the date. Uh, no, I don't remember the date. I wouldn't have... I couldn't even take a real close guess. But it was late February or early March, I would say. And even then, I'd have to shade it by a couple of weeks because, no, I don't... I don't have any positive recollection of when I went aboard the Oklahoma. See, like I tell all these guys, they took good care of the ship for many, many years, and it only took me about ten months to do the thing in. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, let me... Where were you born? In Michigan, on a farm down in southern Michigan. Yeah. You were born, what, 1918? 1918, yeah. I just turned 70. Well, this month. Yeah. I May 6, 1918. Yeah. I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't born in the city. Uh, my mother. We lived in Flint, but my mother went back to the family farm south of Quincy, Michigan. Why did you join the Naval Reserve? Oh, I don't know. I was just in it. Uh, you know, I I had an idea the war was coming, and I didn't want to... I just had a dread of, uh, of 
being in a foxhole or getting hit or something like that. And I always figured that uh, you either made it in the Navy or you were fast dead. And I'd, I'd rather it be that way. Yeah. And uh, that's why I got into that. As a matter of fact, they uh, they sent us over there for four for four months training. And when we got there, they said, "Here, sign this." And we says, "What is it?" And they says, "It's a request for eight months sea duty." After we said, "Hey, we don't want that." Well, it doesn't make any difference whether you sign it or not. You're going to get it. So they extended it from four months to a year. And then I think it was in September that we started this thing. In September of '41, we said, "Hey, uh, listen, our year's up. Uh, how about going home?" Oh no, we see. So it wasn't only the Japs that were treated uh, unfairly. I. I, I was pretty sure we were going to get it. In fact, I had a bet with a guy that uh, we'd be in in, uh, in in war by Christmas. I had a $5 bet that we'd be in war by Christmas. I never collected it because he was killed. His name was Shanahan. You know... You say you're going to put up this memorial. Now, how do you know, know that you get every guy's name on that? All we can do is, the latest number we have is 449. And uh, before we make the final list, I guess we're going to submit the list to the association and see if anyone knows any name. That's well, that's what there. I was going to suggest, that if you, yeah. if you ask some of these guys mm -hmm. that... Uh, because I don't know whether Young's name is on it. Of course, I don't know whether Young was killed. I was told he was. I know Shanahan didn't make it. But, uh, now see, I just found out today that Dunn was alive. But uh, I think that some of these guys would, uh, would know some of them. What's the latest total? 449. 449. That was out of about 1,300, wasn't it? Yeah. Boy, we were lucky. I was lucky. Well, let's see. You've got that and that. Yeah. And that. Let me put that on here, too. So whenever I get back, I'll know. Let's see, it's a mess pass. I guess that's a... Postcard, I guess. Yeah, postcard. And an ID card. Yeah. That's probably the funniest ID card that any sailor's ever been issued. Mm -hmm. huh. Well, okay. maybe we'll...